gentlemen, we'll be moving on to the keynote address for the day. The title is Relevancy of Gold in a Turbulent Time. To deliver the keynote address, we have with us our Chief Market Strategist of the World Gold Council, Mr. John Reed. Thank you very much. And I'd like to thank uh, the Singapore Bullion Market Association and particularly uh, Mr. Alan Chang for inviting me to talk at this time. Your Excellencies, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen. I'm going to talk about gold in a time of turbulence. Um, but before I do, I just want a little bit of free advertising for what we do in research and strategy at the World Gold Council. We've got eight full-time professionals based around the world, three in London, two in New York, one in Mumbai, uh, and one in Shanghai. We produce a number of industry-leading research publications. Uh, and we'll soon be introducing a strategy product which I'll be producing. It's free, anybody can get it. All they have to do is go to our website on www.gold.org and sign up to it, and I encourage you to do so. So the performance of gold in turbulent times. We've been here before, and in fact, in many ways, we've never really left. What I'm gonna start by doing is, is exploring how gold performed in the run up to and subsequent to the last financial crisis. Gold was one of the best performing assets through the financial crisis. It was below $700 an ounce at the start of 2007 and was above $1,100 an ounce at the end of 2009. Over that period, the S&P 500 fell 21%. But as the next slide shows, gold was volatile. It fell from above $1,000 an ounce to below $700 an ounce quite quickly after the failure of Lehman Brothers. Volatility was extremely high, uh, realized and especially actual. This is the period I'm talking about, and you can see how gold performed well, but not without its volatility. I've highlighted the two big events, I think, during the financial crisis, the first of which was uh, in March 2008, when Bear Stearns merged with J.P. Morgan shortly before it would have bust. And then we saw in September 2008 when Lehman Brothers filed in Chapter 11 bankruptcy protection. And although gold performed quite well in the subsequent month or so following that, the massive deleveraging that took place in financial markets saw investors forced to sell gold because they were trying to raise money. Of course, things, things performed better after that and we saw gold perform very well. From 2009, gold traded steadily higher with fears of inflation that would come from the quantitative easing, particularly that in the States. Gold topped out at above $1,900 an ounce in September 2011, and then fell through 2012, and especially in 2013. We saw the peak in gold in 2011 associated with the debt ceiling crisis in the United States. There was a concern that because of an inability to raise the debt ceiling in the US, that the US actually might default, only a technical small default, but default nonetheless. This was the primary driver of gold higher back in 2011. And of course, when that was resolved, we saw gold top out and then fall. But it certainly demonstrated that politics has the potential to drive gold higher, especially if it risks financial stability. Just a reminder of the peak in gold and its subsequent correction. So fast forward to the present. Here's where we stand now. Gold's about $1,278 an ounce when I checked this morning. Um, we've recovered from the lows that were seen at the end of 2016. 2000, sorry, the end of, uh, uh, we saw at the end of 2015. And 2016 was a reasonable year for gold. Correction in the latter part of the year. And we started 2017 reasonably well. So are we living in a turbulent age at the moment? I think we certainly are. Politics has become much more of an issue this year than we've seen perhaps for the last 10 or maybe 20 years. We had Brexit, an unexpected vote by the UK to leave the European Union. We've got a general election that's coming in a few days' time in the UK as well, and that could potentially throw up some unexpected results. We saw the election of President Trump. 
and I don't think anybody needs reminding quite how remarkable that is turning out. We've got populist parties in, in much of Europe, Italy, France, Netherlands, Greece, Austria, etc. And then more locally, we've got tensions in North Korea and the Middle East conflicts that seem to rumble on forever. As well as political turbulence, though, we've also got financial turbulence as well. We're in what I would describe as a post-financial crisis malaise. We haven't really recovered, I think, from the, uh, the sharp slowdown in the economy that we saw in 2008, 2009. And even as we do recover somewhat, the rate of recovery is, is pretty slow. Larry Summers has talked about secular stagnation in the global north, economies that are growing at much lower potential than they have in the past. Part of this, I think, is due to the so-called balance sheet recession. There was too much debt in the lead-up to the crisis in the Northern Hemisphere of developed markets, and that debt really hasn't gone away. It's been moved around, hence the tepid recovery. And as I'll show a little later, it's concerns also that asset markets are overvalued. This is something I stumbled upon a few months ago. It's a, uh, an index of global policy uncertainty. This, the global one is collect, collected from newspapers where the use of the words global policy and uncertainty come together. And you can see how that has increased, first in the run-up to the financial crisis, but it hasn't gone away. And in fact, in the last few quarters, we've seen an increase thereafter as well. There's more uncertainty around, I think, than we've seen for quite a while. The point I made before about the recovery uh, of the economy also from the global financial crisis is illustrated in this chart. You can see growth rates. I, I took the G8 because I couldn't get a long enough data series on the global, but it, it's a similar picture. But you can see that the, the G8 real gross domestic product growth rate has been somewhere just shy of 2% since the crisis. This is pretty low. Normally, economic recoveries are related to the size of the, uh, the reduction that you see during the recessions. Such was the scale of the recession that we saw uh, in 2008, 2009, one would have expected a much faster recovery, but that hasn't happened. And I think it's because of the, uh, the balance sheet and the debt issues that I mentioned before. Talking of debt, this chart to me is quite an interesting one, and it shows the US 10-year bond yield back to the 70s. And what you can see is since 1980 to date, we've been in a 36-year bull market in US government debt. Yields have fallen pretty steadily, particularly over the last 20 years. Um, one has to question how long this can continue for. One also has to question what the outlook is for investors who invest in, in debt markets at the moment when you think about the very low yields that they're, uh, they're buying. Similarly, I think equities are also expensive. The, the chart to pay attention to here is the green line. It's the S&P 500, PE ratio, but a cyclically adjusted PE ratio produced by Robert Schiller. What it does, it takes 10 years of earnings rather than just one year of earnings, tries to strip out the effects of uh, the crisis. Sorry, tries to, uh, to strip out the effects of um, cyclical slowdowns, and in this case, the crisis as well. So what you're looking at here is a measure of how expensive the US equity market is. And what you can see is that the green line has been higher than this on occasions in the past, notably in the run-up to the Wall Street crash in the 20s, and also during the dot-com bubble at the end of the 1990s. Note that we're considerably higher now in terms of this valuation metric than we were before the 2008-2009 crash in equity prices. Now, this tells you nothing about what's going to happen to share prices in the next three months, next 12 months, maybe even the next two, three years. But what it does show you, for investors who are looking to make long-term investment decisions, they're probably going to get some pretty low returns over the longer term. Another chart that I've, I use when I talk about the outlook for gold, 
one of the things you learn first when you sit on a, a gold trading desk um, is when the dollar's strong, the gold price is generally weak. What I've got here is the uh, performance of the US dollar. It's an effective exchange rate. This one produced by the Bank of England back to 1975. There's been three big bull markets in the US dollar over this period. The one from 79 to 85, one from 95 to 2002, and the one that started in, in 2011. And what you can see, these things typically have lasted six or seven years, and we've seen increases in the dollar on this measure by between 44 and 54 percent. So far, since July 2011, we're approaching six years of a bull market in the US dollar. We've seen gains of actually as high as 42 percent, and we're now at about 37, 38. I haven't updated this slide for a while. So I'm not saying the dollar's about to collapse by any stretch of the imagination, but what I am saying is this bull market in the dollar is getting old, and it's also that the dollar's come a long way over this period. Another point I'd like to touch upon is volatility. Implied volatility across different asset classes. You'll hear regularly how the VIX is at all-time lows or approaching all-time lows, but it's not just the VIX. Um, Euro dollar, gold, I could have picked any number of asset classes. Implied volatility in these assets is very low. That tells me that the market is complacent. It tells me that people may be taking too much risk because volatility is low, they can strap on more of whatever they want to buy. The chances of things going wrong and, and, and uh, this suddenly spiking higher, I don't think should be ignored. Against that backdrop, if you look at the gold price in longer term, and I've gone back to here in, in I've taken gold back to when it was effectively freed up towards the end of the, uh, the gold exchange standard, showing the gold price in, in nominal terms, the price that we all trade every day, but also real terms, uh, real 2017 terms. And what you can see if you look at this is that, generally speaking, gold's traded in a range of something like $400 in real terms, to the highs we saw of about $2,000. So the current price at the moment of about $1,270 is merely about average compared to the, the range it's traded at over these periods. So hardly as expensive as you can see the equity markets or the bond markets may be. So has gold ever looked more alluring? We've got political shocks and worries around. We're ending, no, nearing the end of the recovery that we've seen from the, uh, the economic crisis in 2008, 2009. Interest rates are starting to go up in the United States. <coughs> Unemployment levels there are reaching typical lows. Because of very low interest rates, asset markets are looking expensive. Bond yields are very low, bonds are expensive. Equities look expensive compared to uh, their earnings. And yet gold is averagely priced after the US dollar has come a long way. I'd say as well, a couple of points here that I've taken from our investment uh, research team. Gold is not just there for times of turbulence. We all know that gold is one of the most effective portfolio diversifiers. It does particularly well when equity markets fall sharply. It's been a source of returns for portfolios delivering comparable returns to US stocks over the long run. And gold's outperformed inflation and cash over the long term. It's interesting if you look at the chart on the, on the right hand side, and I apologize for the size of this chart. During periods of low inflation, gold beats the return of inflation by a little bit. During periods of higher inflation, though, gold's return substantially beats the performance of inflation. It is that gold can improve risk-adjusted returns of a portfolio. Some of the portfolio analysis that we've done shows the effect of putting some uh, gold into a portfolio 
and the improvement that you get to the returns uh, and the reduction in volatility of the overall portfolio as well. All, this, all of this research is available on our website with considerably more information about the, uh, the benefits of adding gold to your portfolio. So I'd like to finish off by just saying gold performs well during times of turbulence. I think we're, it's clear at the moment that we are in a turbulent environment and potentially one that's likely to become more turbulent. I think asset markets that compete with gold are looking pricey. Very low bond yields, very highly valued equity markets, and the dollars come a long way. So if we are going to coming to the end of a US dollar bull market, that would obviously favor gold as well. But even for people that are concerned that we may not be in a turbulent environment, adding gold to your portfolio has concern benefits. Well, uh, we are in Asia, and you are speaking in Asia, in, in Singapore. And I saw your analysis about we are still in a turbulent time. And you pick up a few of the underlying reasons. And basically, we talk about US dollar and, and Western equity market. Uh, China used to be a very big driving force, or has been actually a key driving force in the last 10, 15 years in pushing up the price and also demand in this part of the world. <coughs> and net, I mean, since two years ago, it slowed down. Similarly, we saw a lot of legal, uh, also regulatory barrier happening in India. Has this been factored in into your analysis, or would you like to add some color about the, 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 the Asian inference to what, whatever you have sure. and I analyzed to us? No, it's a, it's a very good question, Albert, and, and, and one that I'm happy to talk about. Um, I mean, I guess the first thing I would say is that there is no doubt that Chinese growth has slowed, um, but it's still growing at about 6.5, 6.7%. Growth, to be honest, that the West would kill for, figuratively at least. Um, I think the other, the other factors that are affecting China, rather than just the headline growth rate, though, are the rebalancing of its economy away from more capital-intensive, commodity-intensive um, sectors towards a greater proportion towards consumption. Um, that's going to have profound impacts upon the demand for hard commodities, I, I think. Um, it's likely to have some decent implications for consumption commodities as well. And I think gold fits into that quite nicely. Um, in terms of India, India is probably the fastest growing large economy in the world at the moment. Um, and the, the, the changes that are being undertaken by the Indian government have been, to be frank, quite stunning with the demonetization process that took place last year in November, with the introduction of GST throughout the country being implemented in, in the next few months, uh, and wiping away a whole host of regional um, barriers to trade and commerce. Um, these things should help India grow and become a more formalized market. Um, and and we'll, I'm sure will be very good for the economy in the next five to 10 years. I wouldn't be surprised if we don't see a few hiccups in the next 12 months or so, however, as, as all these policies are implemented. But I'm, I'm certainly less concerned about the outlook for Asian growth than I am from the indebted so-called developed world uh, of, of the G8. Are those numbers factored into to my view? Yes, I, th I, I think we take for granted that uh, Asian economic growth will be strong. If, of course, there were to be something which were to interrupt that domestically in China or India, that could only compound the potential um, for economic turbulence around. So, Sorry, uh, John, I had a question regarding the relationship between the turbulent Turbulence we see uh, in the political uh, scene around the world, 
in terms of missile launches and you know statements by the U.S. president um, or even terrorism. So we're seeing very turbulent times, but it seems the markets seem to be ignoring that. As you mentioned, VIX are at a historical low. So what is what do you think is the reason behind this? Why is this strange sort of disconnect between what the markets are doing in terms of volatility and what is happening outside? It's a good question, and, and anybody that's been involved in the gold market for any length of time will remember the gold price going up and spiking higher on various terrorist events or wars or, or such like in the last 20 or 30 years. Um, I think we have become, we, participants in financial markets, have become complacent in the last 10 or 20 years to, uh, to politics, to the threat of war, the threat of other instability, as long as it doesn't threaten economic activity in a big way. Uh, one of the reasons I showed the, the, this slide and discussed this issue here, Gold was going higher anyway, but it spiked up only when we had this concern about the debt ceiling crisis. So you can have all manner of political arguments taking place uh, in Congress. You can have all, all the, the possible statements of, I should be careful what I'm saying here, all the possible statements by politicians which could theoretically worry people but it's only when financial stability is risked. And if I go back long enough, only when oil supply is threatened in the Middle East does, it see, does Middle East trouble seem to affect financial markets because oil is the, uh, is the lifeblood of so many economies. You start to worry about you know, crude oil getting to international markets, then they pay attention to that. But to be honest, War in the Middle East, terrorist attack in London, missile launches in, in North Korea. I mean, it's like, you know, interest rates are low, stocks are going up, why should we worry? Seems to be the impact of, of the international markets. Again, because volatility is low, because people are running quite a lot of risk because of that, what it does mean is that if, if any of these problems were to escalate, then the impact upon markets could be, I guess, more pronounced because they're not priced in at the moment. A lot of complacency. And I, and I guess the overwhelming thing is low interest rates, I think, make financial markets complacent. Mr. Reid, we have one last question on the right, right sure. side. We only have time for a short question. Thank you. You, you mean a short answer? I'll do my best. <laughs> um, you showed a chart there about the normalization of the gold price over time. Mm. Um, and it shows sort of gold being halfway up in this sort of uh, you know, range or something like before. That may have quite a bit more to do with the way you're um, using in, uh, inflation numbers to normalize. If you look to look at the monetary aggregates, you'll get a lot further down. Mm -hmm. Which brings me to the question what role do you think gold will have in the future in, in monetary mechanics or in, or in the monetary system? Is it, is it now gone for good or do you think there'll be a real Well, I certainly don't think we're going to see a return to the gold standard anytime soon. Um, it's not something which central banks and governments would voluntarily return to because of the restrictions that it places upon their ability to, to operate. What I would say, though, is we've seen central banks buying gold on a net basis every year for the past seven years. And I expect that trend to continue, perhaps at a slower pace in the next few years. Um, but once the US dollar starts to, to weaken again at some point, as it will, and international reserves of central banks start to rise again, then I would expect to see central banks buying gold again. So I don't think it's going to have a formal role in monetary policy, but there is a widespread recognition that central banks should have some of the foreign exchange reserves in gold. 
Now, whether that's the 70, 80% that exists in Europe, probably unlikely. But it, the right number for central banks to hold in their reserves, I think, is widely recognized to be not zero, and that a number of 10 to 15% seems to be about where most central bank calculations work out. So it's not going to be an official component uh, of monetary policy. Um, I don't see a gold standard again in well, even the younger people's uh, lifetimes in this room. But I do see gold forming an important role in, in, in central bank reserves for as long as I can see.